My name is Derek Fortini. I'm the director of the Estes Park Museum. Today is January 17th, 2022. We are at the Estes Park Museum and I will be interviewing Greg Steiner. So could you please state your name, birth date, and where you were born? Greg Steiner, uh, August 9th, 1934. And I was born in downtown Los Angeles, California. So Greg, you're a man of many talents. Can you share with me specifically how you became an artist? Well, that's a very long question. And if you have a, about a week, I can tell you all about it. But the, it, in general, um, everybody's sort of journey into getting into the art field, especially professionally, is different, of course. People have different paths that they come. They have different people who mentor them along the way. <clears throat> they have lots and lots and lots of obstructions. Uh, the obstructions out, outweigh the helpful hands uh, often. And um, I started designing when I was about four years old. And I started sewing when I was about six, about five. Actually, I was already sewing when I was five and um, with a needle and thread because we didn't have anything of an artistic nature. And my grandmother was a quilter, and so we had these little quilt pieces. So I started sewing because I didn't have anything else to do, and I had busy hands, busy hands. My mother was always saying, Greg, put your hands in your pockets. And so I started out that way, and by the time, then when I came to Colorado in 1940, I lived with my grandmother in Cripple Creek, and she had a treadle sewing machine, which fascinated me because I had not seen one of those. So she taught me how to sew on the sewing machine, which was wonderful. I loved to do that. And um, I had a little boy that lived next door to me, was the same age as I was. We were both five at the time, and we liked to go out and um, hike the, the, through the meadows. We, we pretended like we were way out in the wilds and we were uh, watching the elk herds or the buffalo herds go by, which were cows. Um, and we would pack, a, my, my grandmother would pack us a lunch and we'd go out and, and spend the day and watch the buffaloes. And uh, so one day I told my grandmother, uh, I was always very, very full of myself. And I told my grandmother, I want Charlie to come over and we're going to have a luncheon. She said, luncheon? Where did you ever even hear, hear the word luncheon? She said, I want luncheon and I want it with the good china and I want it with the good crystal. She rolled her eyes and so she put sandwiches together up for us and we had her good china and her good crystal and in the middle of the lunch I looked at Charlie and I said, I can eat glass. I mean, I would do anything to get attention. And he said, no, you can't. And I said, watch this. And so I picked up grandma's glass and I bit the side out of it. Just as grandma came through the door <laughs> and that put a rapid end to the luncheon. But anyway, just as a, a anecdote about how awful I was to live with, and then when I started tap dancing, which I loved, it was my life for a long, long time. And again, I was, my little brother, who was six years younger than I, I would tap dance my way around the kitchen and everywhere, because I had to have tap shoes on my street shoes, because I didn't have, I couldn't afford to buy tap shoes. So I would tap dance no matter where I was, because I always had the taps on. And my, mother, and my brother started crying, and he went over to my mother, and he said, will you make Greg stop dancing? And so I had to stop that time. But um, I was, we didn't have pencils and paper or watercolors or any of that sort of thing until I was about eight or 10 years old. And because of the depression and the war and all of that sort of stuff, and, um, uh, so I started doing 
some drawings, but the only paper I could find were old envelopes. And I still have one of the drawings I did in 1940, uh, must have been 1944, 45. And, um, it, I, and I, it was a watercolor, and it's on a little envelope so big, and it's someplace in the pile of stuff I have. And uh, I did various and sundry things. When I was in middle school, I entered the, the annual art show, which took place in the city park. And it was a, a big art show, covered several counties and towns. And uh, of course, I entered as a junior high student. And when we went to see the show, I didn't have anything in in the show. And I told me that I got accepted. They said, oh, well, you, we moved your stuff. So they put it into the adult section. And my art teacher was showing in the in the same show. And uh, I won the first and second prize, and she won the third prize, and she never spoke to me again. But uh, then in high school, uh, one of my art teachers was my counselor. And the other one was a very nice woman. I can't think of her name now. That was 80 years ago. Um, but she was very, very nice, and I eventually, she asked me to design her wedding, which was one of the first weddings that I did complete design for. And that was when I was a, so or a junior in high school, I think. And um, uh, my art teacher, who was my counselor, I told her, I said, I'm, I'm going to be an artist. I want to be an artist. And she said, well, you're never going to make a living doing what you're doing. And the school system in California at that time was going through a lot of major changes. The war was over. It had been over just three years when I started high school. And the big thing was a transition from building armaments, which California was just full of factories building airplanes and submarines and everything else. And so they had to have something to do with all these people and computers and were just beginning to come on. They were not available, but the design and, and the mechanics of it and all. So they were looking for mathematicians and scientists and stuff. So they changed the curriculum in the high schools so that you were basically, you had to take all these math classes and do all kinds of stuff, which I wouldn't do. And uh, so the arts got sort of left to the side, although we had, um, a, our high school had a separate, completely separate building for the art department. It had the art department and the uh, homemaking department were in, in one building. And um, uh, I entered some contests, you know, in, in high school there are all kinds of contests that you can enter. And one of them was a national program for a national poster contest for um, the Red Poppy um, program from the second from the First World War. And but you could not use any of the of the phrases that had been being used for almost a century, um, over 50 years anyway. And so I designed a, a, uh, a poster, and it went all the way to the national uh, show in Washington and it won a prize. It didn't win the first prize, but it won uh, 50 silver dollars, which was the way they paid, and they, and they paid it in silver dollars. And so they wrote back to the teacher and said, you know, one of your students won this prize. And she didn't like me. And so she gave me the money and with begrudgingly, and uh, which was a lot of money in those days. And um, uh, uh, anyway, she gave me the money. And I was also um, 
working on, I, I wasn't a, a news, a, a journalist, journalism student, but I worked with the, uh, the school paper and did some illustrations and things for them and uh, that sort of thing. And they would put anything to happen to anybody in the paper, but she was sure, made sure that nobody ever printed anything about me winning this prize, which ticked me off. And so I sort of battled with her clear through the high school. And I had not, I had been doing, uh, I mentioned before that I was raised in the, the federal child care system during the Second World War, uh, along with my three brothers. And we had good teachers, and we had one teacher who spoke fluent Spanish, and so all of us took Spanish lessons when we were little kids, and, um, and got pretty good at it. And um, uh, so we were, uh, uh, we didn't have anything to play with. There were no toys. And so I started putting together little groups of kids to do shows. So we'd get a big cardboard box if we could find one and color the front of it to look like a big radio and sit inside of this big box and read um, radio scripts. My mother knew a bunch of people in the radio business and so she would get us the scripts from Red Rider and some of the other uh, scripts. And so we would read these scripts and the kids would all just sit out there and stare at this box like, they were, like it was a TV set. We, um, <clears throat> we started uh, doing things like painting murals on the walls, which we did with to poster paint mixed with cleanser so that we could wash it off easily. And we did things like that. And um, um, uh, so I went through school and when I got out of high school, I had not successfully applied to a, a, a school yet. I was trying to go to the Chouinard's Art Institute or the LA Art Institute, and I couldn't stand them because they allowed smoking in all the classrooms and I couldn't stand the cigarette smoke. And so I went to the Pasadena Playhouse and got in and my mother, I don't know how she managed it, got, it, got me a scholarship at 18 and you were supposed to be a minimum of 20 years old to get into the school. So everybody was at least two years older than I or more. And um, uh, I, I turned 18 in August and started at the Playhouse in, at, in September. And uh, before the first of the year, I had designed and built my first professional stage set. And I had not built sets. I had designed a couple for the, to, to turn into the school, uh, they, they said, well, you have to send us pictures of some set. So I did two drawings and sent them and they said, fine. And uh, um, they were nothing grand. It was, uh, they were, first of all, I had never read a script and uh, except for the radio scripts, but I didn't, that was not <laughs> quite the same thing. But I could visualize things I've always been able to visualize uh, uh, images or colors or whatever. And so anyway, I uh, started designing and building and painting stage sets. And in those days, we did not have mixed paint, like you can go to a hardware store now and buy paint. We had 55 gallon barrels of pure pigment and we made our own paint every day for the show we had to do. So we'd come in early in the morning and put a bucket of water on this little stove. And when it got boiling, you put chips of rabbit skin into it and make rabbit skin glue, and then mix your colors. And you had to mix all of your colors you were gonna use for all day long. And so we had all these buckets of paint sitting around. You had to do this every day. And once in a while you could keep something over a day or so, but it wouldn't keep very long. And um, so we were 
designing and building and painting sets and moving sets and things around, and I just took to it like a dog takes to dog food, and then um, uh, just uh, uh, we had we had some formal classes, if you could call them that. Uh, a lot of them in architectural drawing, which I had done in high school, and I liked doing that, and I designed a couple of houses when I was in high school, um, uh, one of which eventually we built 60 years later. Um, but uh, the uh, upshot of the whole thing was that I was painting uh, canvases that were the size of a room, some of them the size of a whole house. And so I got used to working in that kind of a framework, which I did for 10 years. And uh, I was also going to school at the same time because the Pasadena Playhouse did not, you had to have two year you had to have gone to your first two years of college to get into this playhouse. And so the, they, your, your junior and senior year, you would be at the playhouse and you, you could get your BA then, and of course stay on for a master's or a PhD. They, they went the whole, the whole way through PhDs. And uh, so I was, then out of school, after I got out, after my first year, I had an AA degree in uh, uh, theater arts, uh, or in, in uh, television tech was what I studied the first year. And, uh, we're, and during that time, television was just getting started in Hollywood, and they had opened two uh, television stations, KTLA and KTTV, and they were both, well, one of them, KTLA, was in the, uh, um, what, I can't think of the name of the movie studio, one of the big movie studios, and KTTV was on Hollywood Boulevard in a building that had been a carpet warehouse. So it was this huge, enormous, empty building with TV stuff set up in the middle, in the front. It was also, there was a booth in this, against the front wall where the front door came in that was all glassed in, and it was the local radio station. And they'd broadcast from that booth. They did all the news and everything. And in those days, there was not, well, there was not insulation like we're used to putting in places where you have to have a dead, of uh, sound, or no sound. So all the walls were covered with egg crates because they're made out of crushed paper and they made the, and they are textured and so they made a perfect sound uh, uh, buffer. So the wall in this thing is all covered with this stuff and there was this one guy who, and, and I happened to be there when this happened so I know it's true, one guy who was there who did the news and he got a little bit full of himself sometimes, and the rest of the people, including the tech crew, got a little bit ticked with him. And so in the middle, right in the middle of an hour-long news broadcast, they went in and took all of his clothes off of him, and he could not stop talking because he was on the air, and they were very quiet, and they completely stripped him and left him in this glass booth, and they all left. And it was... <laughs> I mean, it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my whole life. And, and it was, uh, you know, I didn't realize that, that uh, at that point how much fun you could have it be in the various and sundry theater uh, aspects. Um, I did do some radio shows, but not very many. And um, I had a very, my voice is lousy now, but um, I had a very squeaky voice. And so I took, I had vocal lessons at the Playhouse, of course, like everybody did, and was able to manage my vocal range better. And um, was doing an interview. We were having a one-man show in uh, someplace, 
in the East, and the sponsor had gotten a radio interview for me. And so I went in and talked to the guy, and he said, well, let's just do a little run first before we do anything to see how you record and how it works. So I go in and I'm, and he said, oh, well, that's okay. He says, I'm a little worried about your voice. And I said, well, that's okay, I can fix that. So uh, we started the interview and I said, <clears throat> my name is Greg Steiner. And I went through this whole thing in my very sophisticated low register voice, which I thought was wonderful. And he just sort of sat there and finally he said, I didn't think you could do that. <laughs> but I, anyway, there were a lot of fun things that happened. And um, uh, when we started the Dark Horse Theater in 1959 in Estes Park, well, actually, the Dark Horse with me started in uh, about 1960, I mean, 1957. 57, 58, 57. Um, I, came, I had been in Korea for 18 months. And uh, when I came back, I still had some time in the Army. So I got shuffled up to Washington State, and I took over managing the post theater. It had a nice theater, and we did a lot of shows. And Jerry Carlson, who was just in the Army, just waiting to get out, like everybody else, um, it came to audition for the show, for the, the, actually the first show that we did in that theater. And um, he and I became very good friends and did a lot of shows together during that two years, we were, or the year we were together. And before I got out of the service, which was about a, almost a year before he was going to get out, um, he asked me if I'd be interested in working in a little theater. He was going to start in a little mountain town called Estes Park in Colorado. And Jerry was originally from, from, um, North, from uh, Longmont. And um, I had never heard of Longmont, Colorado. Um, but anyway, so I said, well, I don't know. I, I had, uh, when I got out of the service, I already had a job at the Playhouse as a designer and, and uh, are a technical designer for the theaters. And uh, so I said, I'm going to be working at the Playhouse, so you just, if when you get out, call me if you decide you're going to do it. So the following January, he called and said, I'm going to go ahead and do the theater. Do you want to come? So I said, well, you, when do you need me? Because I have shows booked until the first week of, Jan of June. And he said, well, that would be fine. You don't need to be there until the 15th. So I closed down all the, we had three student theaters and a TV studio. And I was also working for Gilmore Brown, who was the man who created the, dark, or the Pasadena Playhouse. He had a private theater. Uh, and I was, I designed sets and did lighting and stuff for him as well. And, um, so I had to close all the theaters down and drove to Estes Park and, um, and found out that where we were building the theater was inside a swimming pool, <clears throat> the municipal pool, which was behind the Riverside Ballroom. And we didn't have any money. We didn't have, uh, I had no idea if there was a budget for, for anything. I never, we never had a, a written agreement about any of that stuff. And there were, there were it was an Olympic sized pool, it was a big pool. And there were posts down the side holding up that was covered roof, had a covered roof, had dressing rooms all the way down the sides, each of them about three by four feet. And we turned all of those into dressing rooms and wardrobe department and all of that sort of thing. But there were no walls between those hallways, those ramps going down the sides, and the audience area, which was the inside of the pool. So I bought a bolt of muslin and 
12 foot wide muslin and we just covered the side, the walls and painted them like the inside of a theater. So everybody had to be very quiet walking down the halls and they couldn't tell dirty jokes back there because there was nothing except practically tissue paper between the, the halls and the theater. And sometimes that got a little out of hand, but not too often. Um, so I was designing and building sets. We opened a new show every week. So we did nine shows a summer, starting opening in, in the end of June. Or first, so we were open by the 4th of July. And the last show was done on Labor Day. And in that, in four years, we uh, produced 27 different shows, musicals, operas, operettas, um, melodramas, comedies, everything that you could think of. Some of them were really good, some of them were really bad. But mostly the good ones outweighed the bad ones and we had a good audience. We sold tickets, uh, season tickets to the summer residents. They were very, very good to us. And they, all of the summer residents, and they still do, uh, have lots of visitors. Everybody wants to come visit somebody who has a house in Estes Park with a guest room. And they always wanted something to do either for or with their guests. So they would buy sometimes three or four sets of season tickets so that they could pass them out to their, their uh, uh, people who were coming to visit which was very good for us because we counted on those people. And um, uh, Anne and I, my wife, met uh, the, actually the first week that I was here. We had just gotten the walls covered inside the theater and we're starting to work on uh, um, putting together the, um, the house and the stage and hanging curtains and doing various and sundry things. And this car drove up with these two very cute dollies in the front seat. And Anne was on the side facing me. And I immediately, Jerry and I were standing outside the theater and trying to decide where to put our sign. We had, the, had a big sign we were gonna put up on the roof. And the, these two girls pulled up and I immediately turned around to Jerry and I said, do not hire those girls. They are going to be trouble. So four years later, Anne and I were married. And she was just wonderful. She took over, she had just graduated from the University of Nebraska in, in journalism. And she was, <coughs> she took over as our public relations director and she also unfortunately inherited the job of selling the program ads, which she hated, but it gave her a chance to run around and meet everybody in town. And, and uh, it was, as far as advertising was concerned, it was, was very good. And Dave Sterling was almost the very first person who bought an ad in our program. And he always had an ad in our program. Eventually, when not the first year we didn't have it, but the second year, I believe it was, we added an ad curtain, an old-fashioned ad curtain to the, to the front of the stage. And Dave bought the big center ad every year. He had the, he, and so he was a very good supporter. He, um, when we were doing interior sets, he would loan us paintings uh, and other props from his studio uh, without question, he, you know, we'd say, oh, we need something for here or for there, and he'd say, okay, and bring it over. And so we got to know him <clears throat> very well during, the, uh, during those four years. Um, the um, uh, Dark Horse operated with our original group for three years. Jerry Carlson was the director, and also one of the lead actors. And we did, we would be in rehearsal for a show during the day, do a different show at night. And every Monday we would switch shows and start rehearsals out of a new show and add the other show. So I got, everybody had to get very 
adept at learning lines and then forgetting them. And that's the hard part, is forgetting about them. And so I still forget everything that anybody tells me because I got so used to forgetting them on purpose that I never remember anything. So don't ask me a question I need to remember something about. But anyway, third, third year, the end of the third year, there, there was an argument in, in what was our governing board. And one side wanted us to do this and the other side didn't want to do it and blah, blah. And so we split up and Joe Hill, who was one of the principal owners of the, or people who started the, the theater, um, uh, all of the, all of the, I might mention, all of the actors in the first years were from the University of Nebraska theater department where Jerry was fin just finishing his PhD uh, the first year. And um, uh, so we had some really, really good actors and uh, they were, it was really, really fun to work with and very few fights. We all had to live together. Um, uh, so we, and we lived in some very strange places around town, uh, trying to find a place for, eventually there were 27 people in our, in our uh, principal group. And um, uh, so anyway, the third, the fourth year, we took over what is now the ballroom of Lonegans and turned that into a sort of little Victorian theater where it was a cabaret sort of thing. So we served drinks and, and not food, but, for, but drinks. And it was very popular. It was right on the main street. It was a great location. And um, uh, we had a, uh, it was called the, the Dark Horse Players at the Backroom Theater. And so I designed a, uh, a little sort of logo of a, a girl dressed up in a sort of 1890s, what everybody thought of as a dance hall girl's outfit, which was basically leotards, you know, but, and um, mesh hose and heels and fancy hairdo. And um, we had a girl who who actually was my dancing partner, besides being one of the lead actresses. And she and I partnered whenever there was any dancing to do. We, she was the one I danced with. And she was also a wonderful seamstress. And I showed everybody the design we were going to use, and we used it on the front of our program and uh, all that sort of thing. She was very cute. All of a sudden, the next day, she comes out with that outfit on, I mean, she was just a, just the absolutely spitting image of this drawing, and I don't. I should have brought a copy of it, um, and uh, so she would stand out in front. You know, we in those days we could have a a, a little sort of a ticket sales booth or table outside the door, which you can't do anymore, and so she'd be out there, unbeknownst to me, my father's family. Uh, he grew up in Englewood, Colorado. And my grandfather had a little sort of a farm there. He had five brothers. They were all from Austria. And uh, some of them came by way of a stop in Kansas and some in Nebraska and so on, but they were all basically lived in Colorado. And so there were, all of them were farmers and they all five had farms along the front range from south of Denver, clear up to uh, Fort Collins and Greeley. And, um, uh, and I had some cousins down there. I had never met them. I didn't know who they were, but they were the grandchildren of my grandfather's, uh, so, uh, my, my father's brother, or his father's brother. And uh, so there was this kid, he was about, maybe 15 years old, and he looked like a farmer. He was wearing his coveralls and his straw hat, the whole thing. And his sister was with him, who was about 18, I guess. And he came up to this girl who was dressed in her very skimpy little outfit. And he just stood there, and he looked her up and down and up and down like this. 
And he turned around to his sister and he said, Gladys, would you stand out here in your underwear like that? So it, of course it went over big. And it's a story that I love to tell. While you're doing, even in college or coming into Estes and doing theater work, were you doing any painting or sculpting or anything in that? Just for theater. Just for the theater, okay, great. I didn't, uh, I did a few easel paintings during the two years when I was trying to catch up on my degree. Uh, I went to Mount San Antonio College during that period, and um, I was an art major, supposedly, but I ended up with a degree in education because the school did not give degrees in, in the art departments, none of the art departments. And um, uh, so I was, uh, basically didn't, I did, well, I, I did do a few things you might call easel paintings <laughs> um, because they were used that way. But basically, they were produced. Um, I was terrible about, in, this, in the scene dock at the Playhouse, we had a great big, huge um, paint frame that would go up, a st up two stories and down two stories or three stories or whatever. So the flats would all get put onto that and you'd paint them and just raise the thing up and down. You didn't have to climb a ladder to paint. And uh, so, as I said, we had to mix all of our own paints. We have all these buckets of paint sitting on the floor. And I would consistently would be painting away and painting away and I would just step back so I could see what it looked like and tick a bucket of paint over. So I finally got to putting a sheet of, of um, pasteboard down on the floor, wallboard, and put all my paint buckets on it. So by the time I got done painting a set, it was covered with paint. And if we had a show that was something I could use them for, I'd cut it up into pieces and make them into abstract paintings, or they might look like something, and I'd make it look like something, and we'd put it on the wall. And those were the first paintings I ever sold. Well, no, that's not true. I sold some in high school, but... Um, uh, uh, but that was basically my easel painting gig <laughs> and, and all of it. Um, but I didn't, no, I didn't, um, I, as I said, I was used to painting stuff as big as this building practically. And that was the biggest problem that I had was going from painting these wall size things down to something this big. I still had to, my brush is too big, I can't do that. And um, I spent the first, almost the first winter, pretty much, and which drove Dave, it drove Dave Sterling crazy because we were painting in the same studio. Uh, and I was doing little practically crafty projects and various and sundry things. And he wanted me to start painting landscapes like he painted. And I, I painted landscapes as backdrops, but again, they're, you know, 20 by 40 feet or something. And uh, so anyhow, I was not really doing a whole lot and came almost to the next summer in 1963. And I had almost nothing to put in the, in the gallery to sell. And he didn't, he was very good. He never complained or he would make a little comment here or there, but nothing, he didn't say, you know, get off your ass and do something. Um, uh, so I finally realized, oh, if I'm going to sell anything, I'm going to have to paint some landscapes. <laughs> so I got busy and started painting landscapes and which I did enjoy, and it was fun going out. And we didn't have time to work in the field. We didn't do, I didn't do any plein air painting at that time because there just wasn't time to go out and do it because we had, we painted in between times when we didn't have people in the gallery. And the gallery was very popular. And Dave had, Tim had a reputation of doing these lectures on art. And, uh, 
And people came from all over the country and all over the world, literally, uh, and would come up to the studio to hear Dave do the lectures and to buy paintings. And um, so at the end of the first year, um, uh, Ann, had, uh, 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 Ann had gotten a job. Uh, she had been working in San Francisco all the time, and she quit her job every year so she could come back to Estes in the summers and work in the theater. So she was with us in the theater all four years. And then last year, she got a job teaching in um, Denver. Um, and, um, and, then, and I was living in Estes Park, so that was the first winter that we saw each other. Um, she always says, we went together for four years. I said, no, we only saw each other for three months out of the year, so we only went together one year was just sort of spread out. But anyway, we, between the two of us, well, when we, after we got married, we were on our way to Nebraska for a reception for our wedding, after our wedding here in Estes Park, and we ran into an oil slick and wrecked our car. And so we came back and we had no money. It cost all the money we had to get the car towed back to Estes Park. And we got home and found a note on the door f from Ned Linegar, that, who at that time ran the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and said, uh, asked Anne if she would like a job at the Chamber of Commerce. We said, would she not? Yes, she would like the job. So she took that job in the summers and, and, um, and loved it and answered all the questions that the people still ask how old do the deer have to be before they turn into elk? And various and sundry things. And where can we find the park? I said, where can we find Estes Park? And they would say, this is Estes Park. And they said, no, 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 we mean the real park. And she said, say, well, then there's Stanley Park. And there's uh, this park and that park. And people would <laughs> say, there's the National Park. Oh, oh, yeah, that's the one we want. So, and people would do the dumbest things. They would come into the studio. One bunch of people came into the studio. They were from Kansas, farmers in the eastern Kansas. And they came in and there's this uh, old woman with them, probably my age. And uh, Dave Sterling was talking to her and being very nice to her. And he said, how do you like, uh, she said she had never been out of Kansas in her whole life. She was in her 80s and had never been outside Kansas. And her family insisted that she come with them on their vacation to Estes Park, where they always came. So she did. And Dave said, well, how do you like it? And she said, I can't wait to get to can back to Kansas where you can see something. There's all these trees and mountains in the way up here. Can't see nowhere. We also had a group, a couple, who came in one day I think I may have told you this, young, young newlyweds who had just had a baby. And they, were, they had gotten some money from their parents specifically to buy a painting for their home from Dave Sterling. So they were in there and they were, Dave was waltzing him around and giving him all the treatment. And he could be the most charming person in the world. And, uh, and he was always wonderful with little kids and whatnot, and, and with old people, <laughs> fortunately. And he, um, so he, they, after a, probably an hour and a half or so, uh, he sold them this painting and they were just so thrilled and they take, took the painting and they're saying goodbye, 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 and they took it out and put it in the car and they drove off. And about five seconds later, all of a sudden there's a and they came screaming back into the studio. They had forgotten the baby. The baby was still sitting in the cradle in the studio. Dave said, that's not the only thing that we've had. He said, I actually found somebody's false teeth in there one day. <laughs> so there were a lot of strange things that went on in the, in the uh, gallery. But anyway, Jerry, it, uh, uh, Ann and I were planning after that first year of my staying here and painting during the winter of going to California in the winter time where I could work in the theater 
and come back to Estes Park and, and have a job here. And by the end of the first summer, I had sold enough stuff and with Jan, Ann's job, we had made more money than both of us had made in the jobs we were doing all winter long previously. And so he said, to heck with that, we'll just stay here. And we didn't have a lot of money, uh, but the lady who owned the house that we rented when we got married, the house was $50 a month. And it was a little cabin over across the street from the Episcopal Church. And um, the rent was $50 a month. And the building was worth it. I, the, the, the building was so small and the ceiling was so low, I walked around on my knees for a week before I figured I could stand up. And uh, the house was so small, the living room, uh, we, we bought, you know, they have the rug company. We had two or three rug companies downtown. So one of the guys that owned one of them was a friend. And so he sold me a nine by 12 rug for $25. And we took it back to our little hovel to live in, to put it on the floor. And the living room was so small that it, you could not unroll the nine by 12 rug all the way. It went up the wall. And, uh, but the good thing about it was that <clears throat> we paid our $50 a month for the rent during the summer. Came fall and in about the 1st of October, this lady comes to us and says, um, now I don't want you, she was going to go to uh, someplace in the South, like Emory, Georgia or someplace where she had a daughter and she would go there to live in the, in the winter because she didn't like the snow and the wind and all that. And she said, I do not trust the post office and I do not want you sending me money for the rent in the post office because I'll never get it. I know those people. I just don't, I don't trust them. So don't send me any money. We said, we don't pay the rent during the winter? She said, no. So we said, well, okay. So basically the only expense we had was our utilities, our gas and, and uh, electricity. And um, uh, so we started a method because the town was only open 90 days. And so you had to make a living for a whole year in 90 days. And so we set up a schedule for ourselves and every penny that we took in, whether we had to have it for food or rent or whatever, um, we put 25% of every penny we took in into a tax fund, we called it. And at the end of the season, everybody would breathe a sigh of relief because everybody had been working 24 hours a day, seven days a week during those 90 days. And, and so people would start relaxing in September and in October the parties would start. And there, was, there were parties, at town, Estes Park was a party town. Winter, summer, winter and all. And we had wonderful parties in those years. So um, what we did was we put, all, put our 25% away. At the end of the season, we paid all of our bills that were gonna come due. So we paid all of our insurance, we paid all our taxes and everything that we had, uh, that were, we had uh, payments on or whatever. And paid, got, got all of our uh, utilities caught up and whatnot. And whatever was left over, we traveled. And we still didn't have very much money. So we started, uh, people would come in the gallery and they would see my paintings and they would say, oh, we want you to come to our town and have a one man show. I say, well, okay, we can do that. Um, the first year I wasn't paying enough attention. <laughs> the second year um, I said, okay, fine. Give me your name and address and your phone number. And people would say, oh, wonderful. I said, you have one proviso. You can't, we, we, it, you have to have some kind of an event for it, you know, a party. Um, you know, you can have it in your home. You can have, rent a hall, you can do whatever you want and we'll provide the show, but it has to be a black tie affair. 
uh, all of the, no, all, that was just no matter where we went, it had to be black tie. Well, everybody just loved it. They just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. So we did black tie shows all over. And Anne and I dragged our little trailer behind the car with all the paintings and sculptures. We'd take them into some town, go to these people's homes, and sometimes, oftentimes, they would put us up, uh, or we'd go to a no-tell motel. And we had a list of hotels from Los Angeles to New York, none of which was over $6 a night. And so we did stay in one uh, Holiday Inn in Minneapolis, I think it was, because Ann got sick and she just really was not doing well and we didn't have time to go looking for a place for her to stay. So we spent all of $15 in a big hotel to stay over that night. Yeah, what do you think was the most valuable lesson that Dave Sterling taught you? Well, um, he was very good. He was a uh, uh, he taught by example, and he would just say, uh, you know, he would be working on something, and he'd, uh, I'd go and watch him mix colors and uh, stuff like that, and um, and he'd tell me why he, why how he laid out his palette. Everybody does it differently, and and why, and uh, a lot of things like that that were just general. Uh, stuff while we were just, I would, I'd go in while he was painting in his studio and sit down, we would just gossip and he'd just talk about stuff. And uh, after the, uh, I don't know when, well, the very first year, uh, practically from the outset, um, I, Dave would get up and do his speeches when people come in. We had, we could seat about I think probably 35 or 40 people in the studio. So it was set up, a large room with chairs all in it, obviously, and at the front end of it, we had um, uh, sort of big shadow boxes that were lighted internally, and we have a stack of paintings that were unframed, and so we'd just talk about the painting and peel it off and say, then there's this one and peel it off, you know, just go through all that stuff. and. It was all about, <clears throat> you've heard this a million times, light and dark, soft, uh, light and soft, light and dark, warm and cool, soft and strong. Those are his, that was his mantra. So then people would say, huh? And so then he would use the paintings to describe, here's what I'm talking about. Light and dark, the light, the, the dark colors show up in the front and then light colors recede. And the same goes true with the warm and cool. Warm is, comes advances and the cool recedes, blah, blah, blah. So we, I learned how to do that. And uh, I was used to learning lines. So I just learned the whole thing one afternoon. And so I started, we, st we started alternating so that one of us had, could be working in the studio while the other one was doing the lecture. So we'd have, we'd have, like 50 people crammed into this space um, for the for the um, lecture, and it took about oh, about 20 minutes or so, a little over 20 minutes, depending on the crowd and what you were trying to do. And then you'd have questions and answers and all of that, and you get to the point where you'd see all these people come in, and some of them you'd know because they were old customers or whatever. Eventually. And one day, <laughs> um, I was up there and I was talking, and the whole place was full, and people were standing around the sides. And this young couple came in to the, through the back door, and they were just barely able to get in far enough in the door so they could see what we were doing up front. And so I'm talking away, and I looked over and I waved, and I said hello, and um, and I thought. Oh, those kids look familiar. They must be the sons of and daughters of somebody who's a client or something. So I went on, finished, and everybody was going. And when we finished the lecture, whoever was in the back painting would come out and start talking about the paintings that are on the walls that are for sale. And we didn't sell something every day, but we sold plenty of artwork. And 
So the crowd is thinning out, and this young couple kept hanging around. And finally, I went over to talk to them. It was my brother and his wife. They didn't have the foggiest notion of who they were. But you just see so many faces after a while. You <laughs> said, oh, I know those kids. In the springtime, we were busy opening up the studio and getting it clean and because it was closed all winter and um, getting everything set up. So we didn't do really very much out in the field or anything. In the fall, we'd run around down. David say, oh, I want to go over to the Western Slope and have a piece of pie or something. So we'd go out driving, and he was always complaining. He'd say, you, you're driving too fast. He said, we're going by the fence posts. Look like a solid, pen, solid fence. You're going so fast. And so I had to slow down my driving so he could look at the scenery. And so that was one thing I learned. And, um, uh, and he was wonderful. He, was, he, he loved horticulture. He loved the flowers. Uh, he w would point out and he'd say, oh, no, this is this kind of a tree, and that's this kind of a tree, and this or the blah, blah, all the names of the flowers and stuff, so, um, uh, which was a wonderful way to learn about all the stuff that was here. I mean, I knew all the stuff in California, but banana trees don't grow here. Um, but um, uh, so it was, you know, it was a, a sort of a long, spread out, educational um, sort of a situation. Even after I left the studio, uh, Dave was still very good about <coughs> uh, talking about art and uh, about what he was doing. And I actually, one day, I went into him and I said, Dave you are doing some really, really nice stuff, and you're selling it too cheap. And he said, well, it's selling, and it's his, and, and he said, I, you know, I don't want to price myself out of the market. I said, Dave, I am selling stuff for twice what you are, and you own the place. And so he said, okay, if you're so damn smart, sell it yourself. So I marked up all the paintings, and we, and, and sold a big one that very same day for what I had put on it, and Dave said, okay, you sell them. So I really started doing most of the marketing for his work as well as my own. And, um, uh, uh, but anyway, when we first started, I uh, was from California. I did not even have a coat, and I mean a heavy coat, it got cold in California, but it didn't last for very long in the winters. But uh, so he took me to Denver and bought me a coat, and we went to Miningers and he bought me my first set of oil paints <coughs> and brushes and all of that stuff, and set me up in the studio. We had his main studio, and then there was a side studio that had been Jack's studio for a while, his son, and later. He and Jack didn't get along. Jack wouldn't paint the stuff Dave wanted him to paint. And so Dave built him a studio by, of his own uh, up the hill out behind the, other, uh, behind the house that, that, they, that they lived in. And it was quite a nice little studio. I worked out there for, uh, just for a very short period of time for some reason. Um, and um, <clears throat> so anyway, I was working in what had been his son's studio after he died. And um, uh, <clears throat> so we tried to stay out of each other's hair most of the time. But uh, um, anyway, you said it had another question. Are, are there any memorable stories you'd like to share about the Dave Sterling studio, uh, interactions with visitors or celebrities, anything like that? Yeah, <clears throat> I think I told you about the Lawrence Melchior coming in, <clears throat> singing his one note so Dave could say he sang there. Um, <clears throat> one summer, um, the Atomic Energy Commission in the United States uh, never met outside Washington, D.C. And they had never, ever done that. And so somebody who was 
part of that group or allied to it some way, um, said, let's, in the summer, they, they always had a meeting in the middle of the summer and said, who wants to be in Washington in the middle of the summer? He said, why don't we go to Estes Park, Colorado, which is where he and his family always came in the summers. And <clears throat> so they, they made a deal with the Harmony Guest Ranch, which then was a fabulous resort and nightclub and, and our second home. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so they made a deal and they were, they completely got rid of all, all the residents of the, of the hotel and only a, 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 a small staff, the cooks and the housekeeping and so on, were, could be on the property and their place was swarm and secret service people and all that. And uh, so they, they would meet there for a, for a week uh, and they did, they did that several summers. <clears throat> and uh, one summer they came and they had asked Dave Sterling if they could come and tour his studio. And he said, oh, of course. And they wanted to do it because the Russian uh, Atomic Energy Commission were going to be in the United States and in Washington at the same time and they wanted them to come to Colorado because they weren't going to go any place in the country and they wanted them to see someplace else. So they brought the whole group to the United States. The head of the commission was Dr. Dr. Zerzievsky and very, very charming man. He was in his, probably in his 60s and they of course had their Soviet guards to be sure that nothing untoward was said to them or they didn't say anything and whatever. And this woman, I mean, she, she came right out of a, uh, a B movie about the, about the Soviet Union. She had on the dr olive drab, ugliest dress you ever laid eyes on and uh, her cap and she was very, very forthright, and she was like this all the time, just watching her, what everybody was doing. And so they had to have at least one of these guards with them all the time. And so they're going around, and, and we were talking to them, and they all spoke some English. Zerzievsky spoke good English. And, uh, and this woman, uh, she had, a, of course, they all had very deep accents, but, but you could understand them. And she was standing there and just slanty-eyed, you know, watching all this. And I was, I, it tickled me. And so I was, uh, always, we always had a record player going with classical music in Dave's studio. And you could hear it. It wasn't really loud, but you could hear it was playing. And all of a sudden, a recording of, of uh, Tchaikovsky symphonies came on. And she brightened up and she said, ah, our music. And I said, no, it's everyone's music. We all love it. And she looked at me. If she could have shot daggers with her eyes, I'd have been dead right there. And she turned her back on me, and she never looked at me again the whole time she was there, which was fine. But um, And then we did, we did a party for Dave's 60th anniversary in, in being in the National Park. When he first came, and he first came in 1916, but he was just doing a pass-through on his way to go to visit his brother in Washington State, who, who owned a sawmill. And Dave went up there and worked for his, his brother that year. And he came back and said, I'm not going to go back and be in the sawmill business, that's for sure. Because he loved Estes Park, he hadn't been here before. And so he, made a deal with the Horseshoe Park Inn um, to be their entertainment director. And he loved theater and he loved showing off and he, he sang old ditties and dirty songs and various and sundry things and, um, and he could play the piano. And um, so anyway, they said yes. And, and he did some watercolors and pencil drawings and stuff like that, and they let him put him along the rail of the lodge 
for sale. And that was how, where, how he got started in Estes Park. Well, then he went back, went to school in Chicago and various and sundry places. And so when he got out of school, he painted here, he painted some in Iowa, where he came from, and he painted some stuff in Kansas and Nebraska. Um, but he wasn't very thrilled with it and ended up in Estes Park um, and eventually built his studio where it was in, uh, in the, what is now the National Park. Then it was not National Park property. And he actually had quite a bit of property there. I don't know how much it was. I don't think he had 40 acres, but it was a big piece. And he deeded that property to the National Park when they were trying to find a place to put the road in that goes through uh, the, the Hidden Valley Road. And so uh, in order to be sure that they went by his studio, uh, because there was a road there, but it wasn't a major road in and out of the park. So he uh, donated the, the land and, um, uh, and of course it paid off because you, nobody could go by that studio without going in to see what was going on in there. And uh, uh, he, he was a marketer and he loved marketing himself. He, uh, he admitted that was his job. He, was, he called himself the first Chamber of Commerce of the Estes Park. He would travel during the winter and wherever he went, he told everybody how wonderful Estes Park was. They should come to Estes Park. Don't stay, just come. And uh, so he carried that on for a long, long time. And uh, cl well, clear until he, practically the day he died. Um, um, but there were, there were other things that happened. Uh, I don't know whether I told you about, there was a major basketball team that was playing in Denver. Uh, and they wanted to come into the mountains. They were from someplace in the east or midwest, and they were just all excited about being in the mountains for the first time, seeing snow in the summer and stuff. And so they came, and they're you know they're all seven feet tall. And Dave was about four foot six, and uh, uh, the studio had walls that were. You know, just regular eight foot high walls on the outside, but the roof went up in a, in a slant before it, le it, it leveled off. And so Dave wanted, he, he had famous people who came or people who were notorious, whether they were famous or not, um, signed the walls. And he had all wonderful signatures, as you well know. And um, uh, so he wanted these guys to sign his wall. But he said, I don't want you to sign the wall, sign the ceiling. So they all signed, standing flat foot on the floor, they signed the ceiling. I don't know whether you have any of those boards that were on the ceiling or not. Not for the ceiling. Because there were some famous basketball players in that group. I didn't care about basketball, so I don't know who they were, but. Uh, So you started the Steiner Studio and Gallery in 1967. Um, where was it located and how is it different than the Sterling Studio? Well, I was still working with, uh, with Dave in the studio up in the park. Um, <clears throat> in 1966 or 67, I think it was in 1966, Dave's Son, grandson, Dave Schutz, uh, had been in the Army, <clears throat> and he got out of the Army. He had a terrible, terrible gig in the Army. He was stationed in Hawaii the whole time, <clears throat> and his job was driving the officers around. So it's, oh, you poor soul. And so he, he had gone to Hawaii <clears throat> after he graduated from high school, um, uh, he wanted to go to the University of Hawaii. And his father, who had been killed in an airplane accident during the Second World War, had left him some money, which he, could, which he got when he 
uh, turned 21. And so he said he wanted to go to Hawaii, so he did, and promptly spent all the money and became a bartender, which he did for many years. <clears throat> he came back to the United States and toured around, and as far as I could tell, his major job uh, was wrecking cars. He, I think he wrecked four cars before, between the time he got back to the United States and came back to, well, one of them was here in Estes Park. Um, but uh, he started, he, uh, his grandmother raised him, his grandmother lived in Longmont, I mean Loveland, and so he was basically a Loveland kid. But he started coming up and staying with Grandpa periodically. <clears throat> and um, uh, so Dave wanted him to start learning how to paint, because Dave thought he would like to stay in Estes Park mostly because he stayed in Estes Park because he likes the bars. But anyway, the um, upshot of it was in 67, um, I was still working with Dave in the studio and Dave, was, Dave Schutz was running around. He wasn't working there, he had a job downtown. And, but he was living with Dave. And Anne came one day, She. Uh, after work, we were talking, and she said, I have an idea. She said, I found an empty shop. This was in the spring of 67, before the tourist season had quite started. And she said, I found a shop, and I think we should take it over and start our own gallery. So I said, well, okay. If, if you want to run it, you go ahead. So she, uh, in 66, the people who owned the uh, do 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 do. Talk about a, a, a flash of non of nothing. Um, the mall on Moraine, a strip mall there. Um, we all know the name of it. Anyway, um, the people who owned it had just taken it over, and the building was just a long, three hundred foot long building that was just a box absolutely flat, and they asked me to design a, a new facade for it. So I did that in 1966. And Gaslight Square. Gaslight Square, thank you. And the, the building, the front of the building was just a board front, and there was, the, just above the, the doors, there was paneling, or wood at least, that went from there up about eight feet or 10 feet or something. And it was all picky cypress, which is a rare wood. It's been illegal to, to cut it down for many, many years. And the wood came from a school that had been built with this wood in Ray, Colorado in the late 1800s or maybe early 1900s. And so it was painted barn red. And, and it was hand-milled wood, so it was over an inch thick. And they're like what you'd call a one by 12, only they were an inch and a half thick. And they uh, tore all of that stuff off, and we put the new facade on, and they, when they tore all the pecky cypress off, they piled it up in the street. And I said, what are you gonna do with it? And they said, well, we're gonna take it to the dump. And I said, no, you're not. And so we were living in this little house out on Devil's Gulch Road. And so I found a friend that had a truck and we piled all this stuff in the, and it was full of nails, of course, and took it out there and pi piled it. It took me months to get all the nails out of it so you could pi pile it up, actually. And Anne never quit complaining about this pile of wood lying out there, but it laid there for a while. Um, and so in 1967, she decided she wanted to put a shop in there. So when I said, well, you know, it's got a new facade, it looks great, and, uh, and even though it's off, and people say, well, you can't run a business, a, a retail business off the main street. It just can't be done in Estes Park. And there was a ice cream parlor there, and 
couple of other shops. And some people came in and after we had got the gallery going, uh, came in and opened um, a candle shop. They were really big in the 60s. And, um, and they ter turned out to be dear, dear friends of ours and we did lots of fun things together. But um, the, um, uh, so Anne, I said, well, I've got a fair stock of paintings and uh, we had been to, to Mexico. Or no, we hadn't been to Mexico. Yes, we had. Anyway, um, uh, we took a driving trip in Mexico and brought some stuff back. Not very much because we had a little car. And so we said, well, we can sell some of those things on, you know, tchotchkes or whatever. And we had a friend who was a ceramicist and we got some stuff from him. So she opened the gallery and uh, she did really well. And she would get somebody in the gallery and, and send them up to the gallery in the, in the park. So it was working for both of us. You know, both galleries were, were doing well. So the next season, after that season was over, Dave told me, he said, I'm, uh, I want Dave Schutz to come and, and he's going to come and live with me and he's going to take over um, your position. I said, thanks for telling me. And so I thought, oh, well, now what do I do? So I, we, we had the studio on the street level at the Gaslight Square, but underneath it was another space equal in size. It was just a basement space. So I turned that into a studio so I did I could paint in the same place and still run the gallery. And uh, so we did that 67 until 74. In 73, I told Anne, I said, we need to do something. We're making good money, so we need an investment. So I said, we'll build our own gallery. So we built the first six shops of the, of the courtyard building in 19, and opened it in 1974. And um, Mrs. Bond, who still was alive and living in her house up there, sold us that piece of property. It's a quarter of an acre. And she had her house on the rest of the property, which is about just shy of an acre, I think. And I had told her, I said, when we bought the first piece of property, I said, you know, we'll buy the whole thing. And she said, no, I'm not. She said, I'm old, but I'm not dead, and I'm not moving. And so a year later, um, she called, and she said, are you still interested in my other property? And I said, oh, sure. So we made a deal with her, and we bought the other piece. And we tried to have her home moved, because it was a historic building. It was so solidly built that the people who came in to take it down finally because we couldn't, we couldn't move it. And it, the reason we couldn't move it basically was because there was the people who wanted to buy the house. I told them I'd give them the house. I didn't want them to pay me for it even. But the people who wanted it had properties they wanted to move it onto. But the roads between where the house was and where they wanted to put it, they didn't, there was no way to get the house through uh, on the roads that were available. And so they finally, we finally just ran out of time and had to tear it down. It was so solid. They said, oh, we'll have this down and, you know, it'll just take hours. Four days later, they're still trying to get the, the house down. And the, the bottom of it was built out of field stone and, you know, all round rocks. They're all laid in concrete three feet thick, and they, they just, I mean, they, was, they had needed a tank with a howitzer on it to get through this concrete and stone. But we finally got that done, and we opened the second stage of the courtyard in 1978. And in 1979, we opened the bar and the restaurant. Um, we didn't have time to mess with it during that first year. <laughs> but in 
But um, so we owned the building, we owned the court, the, our gallery. Uh, we sold all of the shops. The shops were all rented before we ever came to the opening date. Everything was full. And we had some really nice shops, beautiful dress shop and uh, an Indian antiques shop and various and sundry things. And uh, loved the building until the 80s. And in the late 70s and the early 80s, uh, the government, everybody got crazy about oil shale and investing in oil shale and Canada, Canadians were coming to Colorado hand over fist to invest in land, uh, land to build hotels and condos and Denver started I think at least five of the tallest buildings in Denver that were all financed through Canada and, uh, and they also settled in in uh, Vail, the Vail Valley, and Aspen, of course, before, when we first came, Aspen still had dirt streets and, and there was nothing up there. Um, and so they started building all of this stuff. And in 1983, the government pulled all the funding out from oil shale development. And western side of Colorado was just you know, nosed up deep in investments of all these oil companies over there. They were just pouring money into it. The town of Estes Park was, you know, was benefiting by it just tremendously. And so that's why we went ahead and built the second stage of our building. And in, in the 78, finished it. And so by 83, all of a sudden, they pulled the carpet out of it and the slump in business, I mean, Canadians were going bankrupt everywhere, jumping out of windows, and um, it was really, really a bad recession. And in about 86, things were getting really bad and the tenants were getting grumpy, and Anne and I were with some friends down in Belize on Ambergris Key, living in a Mayan house on the beach up on stilts, a thatch roofed house. It was just a wonderful house. And uh, we were uh, out lying on the beach at night. If you remember Cohotec, do you remember Cohotec, the spot, the uh, whatever it was, comet? It was shooting across the sky for months. And we were. This island was, we were out in the ocean on this island looking right straight up at Cohotec. So we're lying there and looking at the stars, and we had a big fire on the beach, and all the other people that we were with were all in this house. So we were by ourselves and we're lying there, and almost in the same breath, we turned to each other and said, Let's go back and dump the courtyard. I said, Okay, we both agreed. We came back and got rid of the courtyard. And I moved my studio into the concert hall at the Stanley Hotel and started a gallery there. And I took over uh, managing the gardens for the hotel, uh, planted a bunch of trees that are some of which are still there. Um, and, and also I uh, took over designing parties and things for the hotel when they I designed the first several uh, shining um, setups and, and always did the Halloween and Christmas decorations and all that stuff. Um, so we had, had a, a good time there and then I also, uh, the, both the, the Normales were very interested in theater and the concert hall doesn't have a real stage, it's just a stage that has room for a small band or an orchestra. It was a sort of a recital hall, but it was a dance hall. And the Fine Arts Guild started using it and built some very tacky additions to the front of the stage and kept adding a little platform here and a platform there until finally the stage that was built on was about 12 feet deep. And the stage that was built into the building was only 10 feet deep. 
and 12 feet wide or 15 feet wide or something. It was very small. And uh, so we started doing theater in that building. And I, uh, I didn't do all of the shows that were done in there, but I, direct, I directed and did the sets and stuff like that for several shows myself. And then I also did the sets for a couple of other director, directors who were doing theater then. Um, so I had my studio downstairs and the theater upstairs. And I loved it because there was, a, of course, the hall was a hardwood floor, the whole hall, because it was a dance hall. And the stage was a, a hardwood floor, but it was small. But it was just perfect for me because there was never been anybody around. And I'd take a break in the afternoon and I'd go up there and dance for about an hour, tap dance and do my cape dance and do all the stuff because it took a lot, lot of space to do that cape dance in. And, uh, and I was still performing in the local chuck wagon shows, um, and mostly out on uh, Harvey 34. And um, uh, so I was dancing all the time, uh, and I did other shows as well. Uh, but we had a good time at the Stanley Hotel. And uh, when the Normales moved out, or were moved out, um, they threw me out, the new owners. And uh, we went back and rented one of the spaces in the courtyard. Uh, that was one of the spaces that we liked very well. And we kept that for a gallery for, I think, two or three years. And then in 1995, we built, um, had plenty of room on our own property, and we were going to build a building, another building someplace, and looked at properties, but there wasn't anything good. So we said, we'll just build it at our own place, so we did. And it was the best thing we ever did. We should have done it years before. And uh, enjoyed, uh, not only I can walk out the back door into my studio, uh, and I could paint. I used to paint, get up and paint in the night when I couldn't sleep, and I gave that up. But um, uh, it was, it's, it's worked very well. It worked very well as a gallery. And we we're only open by appointment, uh, which has worked very well. And I had started doing fine art restoration work. Uh, just people come in and say, can you fix this picture for me? And so I just started doing it. People started talking to other people, and people just kept coming in and saying, fix this. And I never thought about it as a major part of the business or anything like that. It was just a side issue. Now I have been doing it almost solidly for almost four years, and I have not painted a painting from start to finish in that much time. I finished some that had been started. I am in the process right now of finishing, I hope, two or three of them that I think, that I hope we can put into the show this summer. <laughs> so we'll have something to put in the show. Um, uh, but the, the art restoration business, uh, we have never advertised that we did art restoration. And we still get stuff from all over the world, people calling us and sending stuff to us and bringing stuff to us. And uh, some of them have been really big projects uh, that were you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of work. To, to do reparations and various and sundry things. But uh, it's very interesting, and I love, I've always loved doing research. And uh, I don't ever start working on a piece of art until I know everything I know, can find out about it, the history of it, how much it's worth, I, I, until I get it appraised, um, uh, do the, an appraisal on it. I won't touch it until I know exactly what I'm dealing with so that uh, whenever I assign a contract to do the repair work, then I know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, so it's, it's been very educational in a lot of ways, and 
sometimes will start to work on a, a job that looks like, you know, it shouldn't be all that big a deal. Uh, and we have a file an inch thick by the time we get done with the research. And some of them, I, the uh, nativity figures that I just finished for the St. John Catholic Church in Fort Collins um, were originally created in Italy in the late 1800s, late 1880 or so. Could have been as old as 1850, but nobody knows how when they were first done. Um, uh, and the story about how they came, came to the United States is fascinating because they came directly from Italy to Denver, Colorado in the early 18 or the early 1900s. And each one of the pieces, there are, there are 11 pieces in that set. And they are heavy, they're made out of stucco, and they are what would have been at that time life-size figures. We said, to start with, we said, well, they're two-thirds life-size. Well, actually, people were, that, were so little in those years, and I, uh, and I know this for a fact because I was manager of the largest um, wardrobe department, privately owned wardrobe department in the United States that belonged to the Pasadena Playhouse. And I was the manager and, and, did, and director of the, th of the wardrobe department at the Playhouse for um, a season or two. And we had lots of, California was um, uh, basically built up by land grants from Spanish, the, the Spanish king in the 1600s, some of them even a little bit before that. And so there were the land grant families that lived there were very wealthy, some of them. They were ranchers uh, and farmers and, and um, uh, very wealthy. And so they dressed well and they had uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful clothes. Um, Passamentary beading was very, very uh, popular during that period, the late, eight, uh, late Victorian period and so on, especially in Spain. And so these people were, the, the color for formal wear and still is in Spain is black. They, they loved the, the black. Black was a very, very expensive fabric to produce because there, was, there were lots of colored dyes, but there wasn't any black dye. The black that was used in fabrics and clothing was black because it came off the animals, the, the sheep and so on, that were black. But they couldn't dye black, and not without its running like crazy. So the, when I was at the Playhouse, we were, and before that, there were land grant families where the old people in the family had died, but they had trunk big tr steamer trunks full of clothes from clear back in the 18, early 1800s. Beautifully made clothes with all the beading and glamorous, you know, tuxedos for men with wool that was woven that was a quarter of an inch thick. And uh, we got ready to do a show. I was doing a show that was a, a Spanish uh, show that took place on a hacienda in a hacienda. It was about a woman who had seven daughters and her husband had died and she lived in this, literally a compound. And she had the daughters in there imprisoned. She was trying to keep them all virgins so she could get them married off. And she couldn't get the oldest daughter. They, in those days, they had to marry the oldest girl first and then they would go down stepwise. Well, the play is hysterical about this woman trying to keep the men from jumping over the wall and the girls jumping over the other way. And so I thought, this is just perfect because it's a wealthy family and we've got all of these fabulous clothes. And so I go and looking and we had, many of them were hung on, the, had this wall that was probably 80 feet long. And the, wall, the whole thing was covered with these costumes, these clothes beautiful dresses and tuxedos and stuff. Well, the tuxedos would fit you if you were this tall. 
and the same thing with the dresses. The, the, the waists were, you know, 16 inches, and the, the, the women, if they were four feet tall, they were tall. And so I thought, well, at least some of the skirts will work. The girls who ran the show couldn't get a leg into one of the skirts, let alone get it around their waist. So, and I thought, well, here is this wonderful, wonderful cache of all of these fabulous costumes and nobody can wear them. So I know that the people were small. And Italy, Italy was exactly the same way, uh, of course, during that period. And so the figures, the tallest figure in this nativity set would be the figure of Joseph, who was kneeling. But if you unfold him, he would be about four feet and about four, four feet, four to four feet, six inches tall which would have been pretty average during that period. So I finally said, okay, these are people that are life-size, but they were life-size then, not now. So they are basically the tallest of the figures. Is, uh, I believe this, the standing figure is 40, uh, 40 inches tall, the standing figure. And um, so we started doing that project. It's more than you ever wanted to know about the history of um, fabrics and clothes. Anyway, um, uh, we finished that project. It took three years to do the restoration of the broken pieces and the res restoration and to build a new set for it and installed it in we, we finished it literally hours before it was supposed to be shown and uh, uh, because of all of the shipping and equipment uh, problems. But anyway, it was a fun project. It was very, very time consuming. And uh, I had two guys that worked with me, Jeff Hughes, who's a very well-known wood sculptor. Um, he, and, he and I worked for the first six months just getting all the old paint off the figures. And then after we got done with that, um, I needed technical help to do the, some of the building for this new set we did and uh, lighting and so on. And Tim Phillips, who um, uh, has a degree in theater as well, um, uh, he came uh, in, back into town and, and helped me build the rest of the setting and do the wiring. and stuff for all the lighting that we built into it. And uh, so it's just been, and in the meantime, people are still bringing me paintings to restore, two of which I finished yesterday. So we're between jobs right now with the big restoration stuff and I'm catching up on the small stuff. So that, and I did finish two that we had in the studio. They've been sitting there for six months waiting for me to do them. And while I was doing that, somebody brought another piece. And so it's just, as we always say, one damn batch of kittens after another. You just keep working. So you work in a lot of different mediums. You have everything from painting to you know, graphite drawings sculpting and everything in between. How does your, your process or even your approach to a project adapt from medium to medium? Well, I approach, people wonder why I keep painting all these things in different, different styles and different techniques and doing different sorts of things. <clears throat> and it basically all came from my theater background. Because when you design a set, the, the director tells you what, what he wants the set to look like, what kind of colors he wants, if he has any interest in that. Uh, oh, excuse me. And um, <clears throat> um, so you're constantly changing your style and your technique and what the, what the point of the whole thing is, depending on the time period that the show takes place and where it is and blah, blah, blah. So um, <clears throat> I... When I paint, I do the same thing. I try to work out some kind of a technique that I like 
that's going to best represent whatever it is. So I invented a lot of different kinds of styles and techniques that nobody else uses particularly. Um, uh, doing paintings that are done with transparent colors that are just basically put on with a rag that are paintings that are done in reverse. So the color is put on over the whole surface and it's translucent. So the background is white enamel, shiny like a refrigerator. And the color goes over the whole thing and then what you don't want that color, you wipe off. So you only leave the color where you want it, but you have to know what the, what the effect of the f other colors that go on top of that are going to have when, they are, when the light's shining back through. So you put yellow on, say, and the yellow is going to affect every color you put on top of it. And when the color changes, you put yellow, and you would say put um, a, a red color over that, you're going to have orange along with different colors of red and pinks and all these things. But then if you put green on that, it turned the whole thing to brown. And <clears throat> so um, uh, there's a lot of, of uh, plotting and planning to do before you ever touch the thing. Some of the paintings will have 10 or 15 layers of color. Some of them will have as few as three but you have to have the whole thing in your head before you start. And it's very much like painting a stage set because you have to know what you're going to do because if you're either making your own paint or you're buying paint, you need to know what you have to make in advance. You can't do it, um, oh, I need a little bit of this, you know, to <laughs> stir, it around, stir it around. And so there are several of the paintings that we're going to show in the summer show, I hope, that are done with that technique. And then I started doing um, what are wall size cloisonne paintings. And a cloisonne is a piece of artwork that is done with what are called wells. So you have like little women have, most women have got some kind of cloisonne jewelry. If, uh, or there are all kinds of uh, um, Japanese and Chinese and Indian, East Indian um, techniques in bronze and brass that have uh, either brass or even gold thread that is sort of basically annealed to the surface and then they're filled with enamels and then those are fired. And so that's the traditional cloisonne technique. Well, I use the same concept of the outline of the, of the texture, and then I, instead of filling it with, tech, with um, opaque paint, I fill it with transparent paint. And, uh, and it's been lots of fun, and I like it, and it's, it's a, a lot of people say, well, you know, that's not serious for one thing, and it's not, uh, it's not going to be, it's not classic. Um, you're not actually painting something um, or whatever. There's all kinds of excuses, but I do it anyway. And uh, I've done lots and lots and lots and lots of them, and I've done lots of commissions for big buildings and various and some offices and things of that sort in that style because it's very decorative. It's a, it's a decorative art. And I personally do not stick my nose up at decorative art. I think decorative art is very good because you, uh, when you put your home together, you, you're decorating it. I had a client that I was doing an interior design for. I do a lot of interior design work when I can get it um, in Fort Worth, Texas. And it was a in a beautiful old Art Deco building, original Art Deco building in downtown Fort Worth. It's just a beautiful building. And so the floors are all marble and, and, and I'm just doing the rest of the, the wall surfaces and uh, all of that stuff and lighting fixtures and whatnot. And this woman said to me, she said, I want it to be just, you know, just perfect 
but I don't want it to be a stage set. And I said, wait a minute. Every room is a stage set. You're building your room as if a stage set. You are going to place yourself in this as an actor. And it is a stage set. I don't care what you say. And so she thought about that for a second. She said, oh, well, go ahead and build me a stage set. So we did. But, um, uh, and I've done, uh, of course, some bronzes uh, that are in various and sundry locations around the country. Um, I did some wood sculptures when I was in high school, but not really anything much after that. And I do, I've done lots of small sculptures that are done with styrofoam and a, a material that's a paste that's made out of powdered marble and, um, and epoxies. Um, stuff like that, I do those for my wife for Christmas and her birthday. And uh, have done a number of those kinds of things. Some of them have been cast in porcelain. And very, uh, uh, a few of those are left here and there. So it's, uh, I, like, I don't like doing the same thing all the time. When I grew up, people would say, you know, you can't, you'll never make a living as an artist because you, don't, you won't stick to a single style. You have to pick a style and stay with it so people know who you are. And I said, I don't care. And I said, that's the stupidest approach to art that I ever heard of. And they said, well, then, you know, you'll never get recognized. No one will, no one will do a show for you. And there are some, some galleries that have said, no, they won't do a show because they don't know how to sell it. And I've done some big shows and people come in and say, oh, how many artists are, are in, uh, um, represented here? I said, one. I said, well, didn't do all of this stuff. Well, yes, he did. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good. I don't think any of it's just terrible, but that's my opinion. <laughs> How has being in Estes Park affected your artistic career, and both in theater and visual arts, um, and your creativity? Well, um, it's a lot different than living in a big city, obviously, especially for an artist who depends on a big city normally for clientele, um, <clears throat> and also for galleries that are interested in showing work and whatnot. Um, uh, it has, it, th this is one of the most wonderful things about m my career is that uh, when Dave asked me to, I mean, I was beginning to be well known, enough known in California for sets and so on, so that other theaters, I worked in um, a number of theaters in California besides the Pasadena Playhouse. And, uh, but it was getting to the point where I either had to go to New York or I was gonna be stuck in California and in Los Angeles and Hollywood. And at the time I was not too happy with some of the crowd I was working with. The, um, one of the big shows I was doing, a big musical, was completely pretty much taken over by the gay crowd. And it wasn't supposed to be that sort of a show, but um, uh, they, they were doing some um, stuff with rehearsals and whatnot that, that I didn't like. And I said, you know, you guys do what you want to do and I'll come back when you're finished. And um, the next day I went into work and I was fired. And um, uh, which was fine because I turned around and they had another job for me. They started the same day. So, <laughs> um, but um, uh, the only thing I could really do to advance my theatrical career was to move to New York. And the guy that had had the job I was doing then had moved to New York. And so I had several of the other people that I was working with. And I said, I don't ever want to live in New York. That's, I just 
couldn't stand living in an apartment or, and we had other friends in our, theater friends of ours who had gone to New York and they were always telling us about the cockroaches in their apartments and all this stuff. I said, no, no, I don't think so. And so when Dave asked me to stay in Estes Park and paint, um, I had never, I hadn't really ever thought about doing it easel painting as a living. I was, I, theater was what I wanted to do. So I said, well, I will. And, uh, and it worked out financially fine. And we talked about, we, we've done shows and I've, I've had things shown in New York galleries. Um, uh, but I don't care to work there. And Estes Park is the perfect place for me um, my work isn't perhaps sophisticated as, uh, as much as some other artists are, uh, but I'm not fighting other people off tooth and nail, uh, trying to claw my way into a, some kind of a market. I do what I want, and I've never done anything that somebody didn't buy. And um, uh, we've sold uh, artwork to movie stars and television stars and dancers and various and sundry, lots and lots of wealthy um, industrial types and whatnot. So the market is, everybody comes to Estes Park and I don't have to go looking around for them. And so, the, and the audience changes every year. Um, and what, what, what more could you want? It was just worked out perfectly for us. And we love living here, people say, how long have you lived in Estes Park? I say, well, 60 years. They say, oh, do you like it? I say, if I didn't like it, do you think I would be here after 60 years? And we've toured all over, you know, not every place in the world, but we've done a lot of touring, and we've never been any place that we would live. And on that note, I might point out that we were talking earlier about drawings, and I do love to draw, and um, and some of my paintings are actually based more on drawing than, than on the color work. They're, they're, they're colored drawings, I would say. And um, when Anne and I started traveling, not just overseas or out of the country, but in, around anywhere, I started taking uh, drawing pads with me and, and I would draw uh, what I call our postcards. And so we have a collection of drawings uh, that really mean something to us because they're, and, and I don't sell them. I, I have drawn, I have done drawings that I sell, but they're done specifically for that reason and not for our collection. Uh, but, um, and I've done obviously drawings, commissioned drawings, but I will, I know you're on tenterhooks to see a drawing, so I will show you one of them that is, um, this was done in the Caribbean. We were touring, I took Anne down to the Caribbean and we spent five weeks jumping from island to island to island, clear down the, uh, the um, southern uh, islands. And this one is one that was done in, now I can't think of the name of the island it was. But anyway, it's a, we, we have lots and lots of pictures that were done, uh, images, especially some of the, I like to do architectural things, that were done either sitting in a bar or sitting outside a bar or thinking about sitting in a bar or Whatever, and so this is, a, uh, this is actually is a bar. It's, uh, there's the name on it somewhere. Um, and and if I can't find something that's more scenic, I draw the bar. So, <laughs> so this is one of uh, uh, our favorite bar scenes. But there's, uh, I have a lot of things that are, of course, landscapes and uh, of. Estes Park area and that sort of thing. 
some of the other things. I don't know if you can see these at all, but these are were done on the island of Bekwe. It's a very small island, um, and the guy who is the governor of the whole southern tier of isle of islands in the Caribbean. It all it, there's one governor for all of those islands, and he turns out to be um, the local uh, um, smuggler. And one of the things that he was smuggling at the time, which I thought was hysterical, living in the Caribbean, was bathing suits. <clears throat> they could not get bikini bathing suits in the Caribbean, nowhere. So he was smuggling. <laughs> and he was the governor, and he also owned this wonderful inn where we stayed, and they had a group of, of uh, uh, these uh, steel drum players doing a show. And <clears throat> so these are part of a, a group of painting, of, of drawings that I consider they're done very quickly, two or three minutes, um, uh, maybe, as, maybe as long as four or five minutes if you can manage it. But one of the, Guys, how do they are they playing? Yeah. Anyway, these are these are things of people just passing by, uh, or sitting on the beach, or uh, do, taking care of business, whatever. And they're not done to be formally painted. So here's the one I was going to talk about. These these guys are are drum, um, steel drum players. And they were on the beach outside this hotel. And everybody, people moving around and coming and going, and they were facing the other direction because the, orca, the, the band was, I mean, the, the, all of the audience was on the other side of where they are facing. And they turned around toward, Ann and I were behind them. And all of a sudden they turned around and started facing us playing, and they were going to, and so I had about two or three minutes to do this drawing before they turned back around the other side. So th there's a, a bunch of stuff. They're not finished, but they're just fun. And they bring back memories. So we have a number of books full of stuff like that. Thanks so much for sharing that and for your time today. Do you have any other stories or anecdotes you'd like to share? Certainly. <laughs> However, you could stay here for a week, but I'll tell you one more story. Okay. When I was coming back from Korea, um, I, was, uh, I was RA, which means regular army, instead of being drafted. I signed up, <clears throat> so I was in for three years. And when I came back, because I was RA, uh, I went when I was when I went from the United States to Korea. I went on a troop ship from Seattle to to uh, Incheon, and so when I came back, <coughs> um, I cl I cl uh, was classified so that I could go, uh, I could fly back rather than having to spend a month on a troop ship because it took a whole month to cross the Pacific, and. So we're, we're at literally waiting at the airport for this, this plane to take off. And so all we, we were, it was just almost like a great big, huge, enormous pen with a chain link fence around it. And you were waiting to get off on, onto this runway to get on this plane. And the plane that I was supposed to come to go to leave on was a plane that the reason we were waiting was because it hadn't landed yet. It, it was coming back from something else, but bringing new troops. So we were right by the side of the air, of the runway, and there was a plane that was getting ready to take off that was full of guys, and this other plane that was due to land. And the guy, the pilot, I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened, but anyway. I was scheduled to get on that plane to go back to the, well, I guess I was supposed to fly to Hawaii or somewhere. And he came in with the plane 
and he came too close to the other plane, and they, he ran into it and clipped it, and flipped, killed a bunch of guys, and injured lots of guys, and so the, every place, everything erupted into mayhem. And they started yelling um, almost immediately. The, they, had a, they had a medical crew there that they always had at the airport. And if you could call it an airport, it was sort of, you know, it was way out in the middle of nowhere. There were no buildings, it was just there. And, but they had medical staff and they immediately started calling for people to, to donate blood because they knew they were gonna have a lot of transfusions to do, which they did. So we were waiting around and waiting around and waiting around and finally somebody called me uh, or hollered for me and said, um, well, that's the end of your flying back to the United States. You're going to go by boat, whether you like it or not. So anyway, I thought, I'm glad I didn't get on that plane. Well, thanks so much for your time, Greg. I really appreciate it. Well, <coughs> I expect big bucks for it, so. <laughs>